Now, from the standpoint in terms of training needs analysis, what you can do with that model is put together some troubleshooting. Things. Basically, what, we're, what we do is we take our ideal characteristics of the performance system and we use it as a template or an overlay to put over any, any real situation and we ask some questions. We're asking, where does the, re does the actual situation vary significantly from the ideal? And where there's a variance, we gotta, we gotta correct it. You know, you, you write a, you know, we gotta write a prescription. In all our experience in the 15 years of doing this, you know, says that there's never, there's very seldom one thing wrong, that there are usually a couple of things that are out of balance in this performance system that have to be corrected. And of course, where we take the hard wrap in training is, is you know, that since the performer is the most visual piece, when we don't see something, we go to training. The other piece is where we get, we get roped into services that's not necessarily appropriate is because we happen to be about the only solution that's available around a lot of people problems. And if you look at that, see there's no performance specification department with the exception of the industrial engineering department perhaps in some particular areas. There's no task interference department except maybe an on the ball industrial engineering department. There's no feedback department. The data processing group would have you think that they are, but that's nonsense. There's a difference between data and information. They produce data up to the armpits, but not a lot of information. There is no consequence department. So in fact, when a manager's out there and sees something not happening, and they go to the corporate phone book to find out who the hell could help them, you know, uh, there are about two choices, training and shipping and receiving. And uh, if I could ship this son of a gun out of here, I'd make the problem go away, but that's not likely, so I gotta call the training department, and a training problem is born, right? So, when I talk about a performance engineering function in, in the previous slides, I'm talking about some function that has a mission a little broader than the, than the base training group that has at least the charter to go out and look at the total performance system and ask some questions and to diagnose where the failures are. And hopefully, in addition to training, can direct some corporate efforts to see these other support pieces get, get put in place. So then what we're saying now, the other, the, other, the second, the performance system being the other basic uh, uh, premise that I want to talk about, we go back to our performer and the fact that one, we've got to get some linkage between the individual performer and the organization performance. The second piece of that is for any given performer, where we want some particular R and we're concerned about why we're not getting it, we've got to look at the consequences and the feedback and the signal to try and diagnose why it's not happening. So step one is to establish linkage. This is what we need from the organization. Then this is what we need from performers. Next question is what do we have to have in place to support the performer as they do that? And the two together are, is my definition, I guess, of, of productivity or at least managing for uh, productivity. Doing all this analysis when this hasn't been done is nonsense and a waste of time. We really got to do the, the two together. Now there's one last variation on this that I want to point out, that's the fact that you can and in fact must view organizations as hierarchies of performance systems. Okay. Everybody is, is in one. For example, at the beginning of my airline story, I talked about ticket agent out here, who according to corporate training and philosophy says, excuse me, $2 or your life. And there's a person up here called a passenger services supervisor who came out of the back door like a cuckoo clock and dumped all over the head of our ticket agent, right? I said, my God, what are you doing? Now, why is that, okay? Insensitive zone, so send them to sensitivity training, human relations training, all kinds of training. Well, let's just stop a moment. Let's do the same for the supervisor that we did for the agent. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's see if there isn't some rational explanation of that behavior rather than that they're the most recent crazy, okay? That's one of the things we're always talking, looking for, some rational explanation. And if we do that, we find it. 
supervisors have got a lot of things to do with varying degrees of consequences for each of those. One of the things they're supposed to do is see that excess baggage charges are collected, right? I also told you earlier that the airline doesn't measure for excess baggage charges. So if they can't measure it and there's nothing coming back, there ain't gonna be any big consequence to the supervisor of that happening or not happening. Scratch that R, okay? Another R in here, which is reasonably obscure, but kind of important, is called the AWTATO, right? Which is something you didn't even know existed although you've been a critical part of it for many years. It's called the average wait time at the airport ticket office. All right? Most airlines have a standard for how long you're supposed to wait in line to get a ticket. It's hard to believe these days um, that it's still in two digits. Uh, they have a standard, eight minutes or 10 minutes, something like that. And what they have over here in a different little performance system called quality assurance in some airlines, it's a euphemism for efficiency experts, industrial engineers, et cetera, et cetera, whatever you call them. There are a group of, of people skulking about the potted palms in the lobby with a clipboard and a stopwatch. Right? And they're continually doing little studies on how long you wait in line. Now, that's pretty good data, actually. Think about the power of that. If you had that as a supervisor, that information was coming over here. You could make staffing decisions and all kinds of decisions to be sure that you had coverage of the lines. Well, that's too simple. If you had that information, it would make this job too easy because you could figure out how to do it properly. And it would take all the fun out of being a manager up here because these people would have data to do their job. So that information is confidential, not to be shared with anybody. So this is a week, it's a daily confidential report that goes up to a level which can piles it into a weekly confidential report, and it goes on up to the top of the organization where it's compiled into a monthly confidential report, okay? At that level, at the vice presidential level, the contents of that report transcend the organization and then descend down through the organization at 32 feet per second per second, used to nail errant supervisors to the wall. And they frequently need it, you see, because they have missed their standard. So what that says, and in the life of a passenger services supervisor, there's no measure, no consequences around excess baggage charges. There is frequent, confidential, negative consequences coming back on average wait time. So that when the supervisor walks out that back door and comes up to the ticket counter, what they see is no two dollars. They see no excess baggage charges. They see the line backing up, and they know damn well that there's trouble brewing in River City and they take the decisive kind of management action that you'd expect. That's the explanation for why they act like crazies, not because they're after the union, and not because of this, that, and the other kind of thing. So an important concept in, to keep in mind when we do this sort of business is to, that organizations are hierarchies of performance systems, that when we troubleshoot, we frequently have to troubleshoot up the organization, and also just to make, th make it explicit here that we've been talking about troubleshooting, but the same thing applies to designing a new system. You're gonna put in a new computer system, you're gonna put in new accident reports, any kind of system change you're gonna put in, you're fooling with somebody's R in that hierarchy. And the question that has to be asked now is, given that we're doing that, do we have the, the necessary performance system in place to support that at all levels? In fact, we want it done at the bottom, but what are we doing to look at the implications of that on the performance system on the supervisor so that we can make those kinds of changes? So those are the two basic concepts that I wanted to cover here that really make up then the foundation of moving in, into a process. And uh, I guess the performance system, the, when the, the work that we did both in Michigan and, and later at Praxis, the, we began to view the performance system as really the fundamental, if you will, physical laws around performance. And they operate, I don't care at what level, uh, CEO down to branch manager, down to the salesperson, to the foreman, to everybody is in that damn thing. And it's a useful x-ray to look and try to understand what's going on and it begins to, to make believable to managers why things don't happen. 
and it's a way to begin to talk to managers and a way to begin to think about what you can do with training and can't do with training and what's going to have to be done to support your particular training. One thing that's useful to keep in mind when you look at, the, at this performance system is to realize that, make this, I'll make this modification, that you're usually talking about two R's, not just one R. You're talking about the R desired and the R undesired, which is frequently what you got. Point being that in most cases, people don't, not ju don't just not do something, they do something instead. Right? And if we really want to understand why they are not doing something, we want to look at what they're doing instead of that. So what we do is we kind of, when we get into this in some detail, take our, our model and spread it out and say, okay, we got desired responses. What are the consequences, positive and negative, for those? We got the undesired consequence, or undesired responses. What are the consequences, plus and minus those? Okay, what's our feedback coming back? from each of these, okay? So when you get that kind of separation, you're really saying, all right, someone's, we, be, we look at really, the desired is collecting two dollars and the undesired is ignoring it. Okay, and then you look and see what are the consequences of, of ignoring it. And uh, because what you're really dealing with is, is a balance of consequences that, that is, uh, I think, an underlying powerful concept there. Because if you go back to the, to the first premise, key, uh, the key point under the performance system where I said behavior is influenced by its consequences. If you believe that, then that means that when somebody, i.e. some damn fool, usually, persists in doing the wrong thing, now that means that there is something very positive for them doing the wrong thing or something very negative for doing the right thing. I have to understand that. And you, you know, your first assumption is when people persist in doing the wrong thing is to assume that you happen to have luck down to the mother, lo mother load of crazies here in uh, Illinois. You just haven't recruited wrong. And, um, but if you can get beyond that and you can say, why do these otherwise rational, intelligent people persist in doing the undesired thing? Okay? Our model says it has got to be for some rational, logical, reason and I gotta as an analyst find out what in hell that is so you stay with your analysis until you can you can identify either that the negative consequences of the desired are so extreme or there are substantial positive consequences for the undesired and with that you just got to take that on faith and that's a that's a it's a very useful template that to uh, to keep in in mind why does the first line supervisor who we want to discipline people in fact not discipline workers and if you go look and see because when he wrote up he or she wrote up these people for leaving the workspace before the end of the shift like they were conned into thinking they were supposed to be doing by all the human relations hype and the introductory training they got the consequence of doing that was one you know, hysterical ridicule from the union steward who said, I'll bet you a cup of coffee that these people will be reinstated within three weeks and you're going to look like a bigger horse's ass than you've ever looked like before. And the new supervisor says, baloney, you know, I'm following on here as I've been taught. That's the first consequence. The second consequence is, in fact, that uh, they grieve and it goes to second or third level grievance and six weeks later it gets reversed okay. for no particular good reason as far as the first line supervisors because we're going into a sensitive period of negotiations or the international union rep comes by and they're sort of doing swapsies you know we get five of these that on our side they don't make a lot of difference and you get five they don't make let's just trade them off etc whatever it doesn't make any difference in uh, six weeks you've got a supervisor standing out there with egg on your face looking it's exactly as the union steward said biggest horse's ass in the area, okay? So that's the consequence we got for the desired. Now, the undesired consequence is you're considered by your management as being a weak supervisor because you can't discipline your people. The department looks like hell, okay? It's got this great damned if you do, damned if you don't box. Now, what does someone do when they're in that conflicting set of consequences? Well, an important thing 
So you remind, when I was first learning this stuff back at Michigan, a fellow, I was working with a fellow named Carl Summerroth, who was an experimental psychologist. And he said, you know, there's an important concept here that goes back to the old rat labs, the old ratty labs, when we used to do experimental psychology and you put a rat in a box and you put the electric grid underneath and you play little games and if they do this, you shock them. If you do that, you shock them more or less. And you, he said, there's an interesting thing they don't tell you about about those experiments. And that's the fact that, you know, premise number one is that there's a lid on the box. Because if you don't put a lid on the box, the rat's no dummy, he does like everybody else. His first option is to jump the hell out of there, all right? Now, people are at least as smart as rats under these circumstances. So what do supervisors do when you put them in this situation where if they in fact see someone leaving the work position 15 minutes early or 10 minutes early to go wash up early, and if they discipline them, they catch hell. And if they don't, they catch hell. And do the same as the rat. Rat, they jump out of the box. Okay. Now the variations in jumping out of the box in organization behavior are very subtle. Basically, what a supervisor learns is, I ain't ever going to be in that part of the department at a quarter to three if the shift ends at three o'clock, because I am in fact going to be subjected to a stimulus, the response to which whatever I do is going to be painful. So I'm not going to be there. The first line supervisor is not going to be at that machine, that stamping plant press when it breaks down at 45 minutes to the end of the shift and we know it's going to take 15 minutes to properly repair it because, because of safety regulations, we're going to have to have someone come out and block the machine, shut down the power, et cetera, et cetera. If I just don't go there, I don't have to see the illegal shortcuts that those people take to get that machine, in fact, back online in eight minutes rather than 15 minutes, risking someone getting their head knocked off. But it hasn't really happened that much, okay? So the important thing is to in terms of our model, and I just kind of explain it, to expand it here and look at the desired and the undesired and try to understand the consequences because there is usually some reason why these people do this and we've got to understand that if we're going to be effective. And uh, that, so that was one point I wanted to just, I guess the last point on that. Uh,